I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Wanna bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. We are a month and a day away from the start of the 2023 Stanley Cup playoffs. By the way, are you excited? I'm sure I'm sure you're excited in some way for the Stanley Cup playoffs to start. Yeah, I've got a pulse. I mean, I can't imagine anyone who <laughs> likes this the sport at all, and I like it a lot and have devoted essentially my entire adult life to it, um, wouldn't be excited about the start of the playoffs. And, you know, I, I think I made the point earlier, but I, I actually find the games I've seen lately, there's a fair amount of urgency, especially when you get the right matchups with teams that, that have – um, still a fair bit to play for. There's been some pretty heated games, intense games, even tight checking games, which is kind of what the playoffs are known for. Um, and look, this year, you know, I just just returned last night from the general managers meetings in Florida. Like someone there was making the point to me, there, there's going to be a lot of hurt feelings in the Eastern Conference. I mean, there, there's a lot of teams in that. There's just too many teams with with a lot riding on their seasons that had that you know made big trades at the deadline that have various pressure points that have built up over time. Um, and there's just not enough, there's not enough playoff series for them all to win to make everyone happy in their markets. So I think, I think we, we have the recipe for chaos, uh, you know, getting it's in the oven now, Julian, it's baking. And uh, in a month's time, we're, we're going to take that thing out of the oven and enjoy that sweet, sweet cake. Yeah. And, and we're going to do it Gary's way. Because uh, I hope you enjoy the divisional format. He is not changing that anytime soon. What's notable for me about that is it's one thing for him to just kind of say, hey, you know, I don't see anything wrong with it. And and no one else is really saying anything. But it's notable to me that some of the game's best, including Sidney Crosby. They feel they don't, they don't really rock with the divisional format. Bill Guerin, I believe, went on 32 Thoughts. And said that he doesn't like it. Alan Walsh put out a tweet saying he doesn't know any player who likes the divisional format. Why do we live in a world where people in the NHL, whether players or management, have expressed discontent with the divisional format, but it doesn't seem as if the NHL wants to listen to that? Is that a wrong assessment to say? Is that right? Let's unpack this. Well, they're listening. I just think that they don't agree with it. And, you know, the one point Gary Bettman made on Wednesday at the conclusion of the GM's meeting, which is fair and has to be acknowledged here, is that if you line up one versus eight right now, there's a heavy amount of cross. Like you would get a lot of the same matchups, you know, just looking quickly on my phone now, you know, one of the notable differences is it would be Leafs Rangers as of this moment in round one instead of Leafs Lightning. Um, you know, mm-hmm. but it, you're, you're looking at Boston Islanders, which is, a you know, probably Boston's going to be the top seed, obviously, in the Eastern Conference. They're going to get the last wild card performer. You're getting Carolina Pittsburgh, which lines up um, and then it's New Jersey, Tampa. The, the, I guess his, his point is it's not really that different. We have to at least acknowledge that is true. Um, but well, I what think about the Western Conference. Well, I, I haven't uh, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. Late oh no no no! I do, and I don't mean that to put you on on the spot here. I I, I have the standings in front of me as well. Right. And you so look L.A. At it, Edmonton, Vegas. same division. Minnesota, Colorado, same division. So it's Vegas, Winnipeg, and Dallas, Seattle. As of this moment, that would be different, right? Maybe. Yeah. So maybe not. exactly. So maybe maybe not. But like, I I don't think to say because because I've heard Gary Bettman say as well. You know, they would be identical uh, if you were to do uh, one through eight. Uh, as opposed to divisional, but of course that was the case maybe about a couple weeks ago. There's obviously going to be some changes. It's it for me. It's just the fact that there are people who are saying that they don't like this, and the NHL doesn't agree. And I I, I just wonder if there has ever been a moment. And I wish I got to ask this question uh, when it came time for me to ask questions to Gary Bettman. But I wonder if there was ever a moment where Gary Bettman entertain the thought and the NHL entertain the thought of listening to uh like Sidney Crosby and a couple of players in a 
closed door meeting where they discuss the format. And then I guess both sides would just kind of hear each other out about why it works. Or maybe they feel it's a waste of time. I, it just feels a bit interesting to me that like, that's not something that would at least engage discussion. Well, they, they didn't have any discussion in the three days of meetings in Florida. I know that much with the GMs. Um, there was no, and they kicked a lot of ideas around and, and I know we'll get into some of those topics and, and, you know, they range from, kind of practical things to sort of like thinking outside the box things. And and so you, I guess you could imagine the playoffs would fall into that. doesn't seem like it does. I think from the NHL standpoint though, Julian, they're looking at it that everyone is so excited for the start of the playoffs that the first round in particular is, is arguably the best each year, or certainly consistently produces a high level of drama. And, you know, they're worried about the changes to, the schedule they might have to make if they go back to a conference format, they think they might have to change, you know, how many times each team plays each other team. And that would have obviously some downstream effects in terms of scheduling and all that, you know, travel, you know, if you're playing more games in conference versus in division, then there's more travel. Sometimes in the past, the players in the NHLPA have expressed issues on that. So I think that the, the league views it as being part of a complex series of things versus just how do you line up your, your playoff teams to start. Um, but I, I, it's look at it. It's, it's fair. It, it's fair to, to question why they haven't done more. I just think that they like how it works now. And here we are. I mean, it's, it's, uh, this is the world where, you know, the, the March GM meetings are frankly, where a lot of seeds are planted for change. It doesn't mean that they unilaterally change rules at this meeting or anything like that, but usually, usually things get momentum that get changed starting at the March GMs meeting. And so, we, we got to probably wait unless something crazy happens between now, at least until next March before this is even really a discussion at the high levels of the NHL. Okay. Well, then I guess we're just going to have to live with the divisional format. For me, it's less about the format being what it is. It's more just the fact that it seems as if, if there are people who are not necessarily in favor of it, but we still have it anyway. That's just very interesting to me and i guess well, it will just be interesting to me until something changes someone senior at the nhl did acknowledge this week in a private conversation that you know when those players speak up like their voice is loud like heard loudly you know it, i i don't think well it might appear on the surface that they're just being totally ignored I, I don't think they're being totally ignored i really don't believe that um at the same time every time a player just to, to be a bit of a devil's advocate but every time in a player even if it's a high profile player expresses an opinion the league can't just abruptly change what it's doing, right? I mean, it, it has to be more than no than that. But but you're right. You're you basically what you're wondering is there more of a dialogue going on there between those players and the top levels of the NHL? And I, I have no reason to believe there is at this point in time. Yeah, it, that's just what's intriguing to me. Uh, anyway, we will get to other elements of uh, whatever happened uh, over the last few days in Florida. We'll touch off on that in our episode today. Uh, the salary cap expansion talk as well. Uh, or expansion mode, as I believe the term was used. Uh, anything <laughs> we can talk about with the Ottawa Senators sale. Uh, but we will also get into some other NHL news and notes and uh, the Carson Briere incident uh, that uh, has made the rounds on the internet and has led to some uh, apologies and statements. We'll get to that. But first, we need to do uh, sports interaction. Uh, David Bastel still not here, but uh, we'll handle this one just fine. Uh, I'm pretty sure we can handle. Uh, you can bet that just fine. Am I right, uh, CJ? Yeah, we're doing it from the kids' table today. No, no adult in the room. All right. Uh, <laughs> there's never really been an adult in the room, has there? Uh, DV's kind of adult-ish. Uh... <laughs> All right, time for you can bet that. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. Welcome to You Can Bet That. Remember to hit up sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all of your gaming needs. Uh, the Pacific Division. Uh, right now on a Sports Interaction's website, they list the Vegas Golden Knights as the favorite at minus 161. Uh, as of now, as we are recording, on a Thursday morning, Vegas has a three-point advantage over the Los Angeles Kings for top dog in the Pacific Division. If you're wondering about the Los Angeles Kings, they have the second-best odds at plus 301, then the Oilers and the Kraken, then the Flames, and then the Canucks. 
uh, both the Flames and Canucks looking like long shots to win the division at this point. Uh, but the Vegas Golden Knights are the betting favorite at minus 161. Uh, your thoughts on the way the Pacific Division is shaping up? Well, isn't it kind of tasty that uh, the goaltender now logging the majority of starts for the Golden Knights used to play for the LA Kings? You might have mm. heard of him. Uh, he brought two Stanley Cups or helped bring two Stanley Cups to, to LA earlier uh, last decade um in Jonathan Quick and so I think that that's a pretty delicious kind of storyline plot line you know it's it's early days for Quick in in uh, Vegas but he's he's had a nice start there I think that the you know from my understanding the team's really appreciated kind of adding someone with his presence very very kind of serious guy but obviously has has been through the the grind can handle the tough moments he's he really had a tough season um you know, to to this point in LA, but he's he seemed to found some new life in Vegas. So I think I think those two wrestling for the division is tasty, and I you know, I've still got my eye on Edmonton uh, as a possible to to go up and and get the top seed there because the Oilers, you know, I could see them making a push. Their their top guys are really really playing well these days. Eight points out of the division lead are the Edmonton Oilers. All three of those teams uh, doing pretty well in their last ten, but Vegas winners of their last four. They play against the Calgary Flames tonight. Uh, in Vegas. Uh, don't forget to check out sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN. So to put a cap on uh, the Florida meetings, first off, I hope you had time to uh, have fun in between, uh, you know, going to meetings every day. I'm sure you did. Yeah, I did. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it's depends on your definition of fun, but it was definitely nice to be in the sun and you know we, we have a good time you know i was working really closely with my tsn colleagues gino retta and and darren drager there our cameraman freddie and so probably the highlight of my trip was drager got a big suite at the the hotel we were staying at and he had a, a nice balcony and so he he did happy hour uh at the end of each day in, in his room we just shoot the shoot the shit and uh have, have a beer in his room and you know go over the day and then go out for dinner. But, you know, it was, it was pretty busy. You know, it's not the hardest work you got to do, but you're there to work. Right. But, but we did have some, some good laughs in that. And uh, I'm love working with a good crew that I do at TSN. So beyond the playoff format, which we discussed uh, to begin our show, what would you say is the juiciest piece of information uh, that was mentioned that week? For me, the salary cap discussion is probably the most pressing, um, you know, for a couple of reasons. Look, here's what Gary Bettman said. We know that the players are still repaying an escrow debt to the owners that was incurred during the pandemic. And, you know, that was a big part of the CBA extension of 2020 in which, you know, essentially that that sketched out how the, the, the players pay that money back. Well, right now, depending on whose projections you're using, the players will be anywhere from a hundred to a little bit more than a hundred million in debt at the end of this season. Now there's some factors that could change that if, if big market teams like the, the Leafs or the Rangers have long playoff runs, maybe that, you know, there's a little bit more money earned collectively in the league. And so that, that debt might be paid down more, but what's really, what really matters here is that as long as that debt exists, the cap is supposed to go up by no more than $1 million. But, in that CBA that was negotiated in 2020, there's also language that says the parties can negotiate the cap to go up by more than $1 million if, if they so choose. And so Gary Bettman kind of, you know, he, he, he dinged a little bell there in, in his Wednesday afternoon media availability, mentioning that, that the league would be potentially open to some sort of negotiation or discussion on that matter. Um, you know, depending on what the NHLPA wants to do. Well, guess what? The NHLPA is getting a new executive director as of Monday, and, and that's Marty Walsh, of course, coming over from his job in the, in the U.S. federal government. And, and so the reason I find this most interesting is because, one, the salary cap has to be set somewhere by the end of June-ish. Uh, two, Marty Walsh is coming on the job in late March. And and so it, it, it does set up as one of the first, I'm not sure it's difficult decision, but, but I mean, it's, it's going to be an immediate discussion between he and Gary Bettman, uh, the, the two you know, now leaders of, of the players and, and the owners respectively um, to, to figure out where the cap goes. And, and, you know, the background of this, Julian, there's a lot of GMs at that GMs meeting that want to see the cap go up by more than $1 million. 
because they've been basically in austerity measures, I'll call them since the pandemic started and really not having much money to spend. It's it's obviously had a huge effect on how league business looks, on on the way the trade market looks. We're getting more retained salary transactions than ever, third-party brokers, all those types of things. We get teams like Arizona at the, the other end of the standings taking on all this dead money. I mean, these these all these machinations that I think flow out of the 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 fact that there just hasn't been that much money in the system uh, to spend. And so Gary Bettman, I believe, has to be under some degree of pressure from the owners, that, you know, via their general managers to have the cap go up. You know, the players, by and large, I mean, the problem with the salary cap discussion for players, and we won't go too deep into it, is sometimes it becomes a player-by-player player issue. If you're a free agent this summer, you want more money out there for teams to spend in general. I mean, I think it just, it stands to reason, no matter where you are in the food chain, a fourth liner or a potential first liner, if there's more money to spend, you're likely to get a little bigger piece of the pie. Um, but but by and large, I think it's fair to say generally that players would want to see the cap go up. So there's going to be some sort of discussion, negotiation there. And, and so that was maybe the juiciest. It's it's a little nuanced. And I, I realize it might might be bogging you down a lot of details and, and of the CBA. But I think it probably had the most will have the most direct impact on what happens next in the league. You know, when it, when it comes to sort of interesting discussions, you know, one thing that you know, we, we caught wind of there is there was a discussion about extending overtime to seven minutes from five. And, you know, mm. I, I think that that look at, I'm not a fan of the shootout. I'll just come out and say it. So to me, you know, I don't know how going from five to seven, maybe that affects things with the TV partners. You know, I don't, I don't know enough about that. Obviously there has to be some kind of discussion. Are you playing the top players too much in that situation? Cause let's face it. Most teams only use about six players, in, in their rotation when you get into three on three overtime. And so, you know, it, it's, it's, you're, you're really talking with the top end of rosters by and large. And and so you're taxing players, but I think anything they can do to see more games ended before the shootout, which is just to me, sort of a gimmicky skills competition that doesn't really, I feel like if you, if you leave the building as a fan, whether your team won or lost a shootout, it, it sort of, it sort of still feels like a tie kind of like, like, I mean, obviously you want to see your team get two points of your fan. um, But I don't feel like it, I can't imagine it feels like a loss. You know, I saw Steve Dangles LFR after uh, Wednesday night, Colorado beat Toronto two one in a shootout. And he, he said it felt like a tie. And like, I actually, as much as of course, Steve's probably just trying to defend the Leafs in that video with producer Drew's Colorado avalanche. Um, I do think that that that's probably how a lot of fans feel. So, you know, that, that that's maybe a little more buzzy potential item of something we might see change. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I don't know where you want to go next. The three on three stuff, just really quickly, like that seems really interesting to me. Uh, that's not something I necessarily picked up on over the last few days. Um, I guess the big question for me is seven minutes is interesting. Uh, why not just make it around 10 minutes? Maybe it is a TV thing, I would imagine. Um, and I think the hate for the shootout uh, comes, I think, just more of a theory, if anything. But, but like there was a time when like three on three was super new and super cool with all the end to end action happening all the time that when that, that when that period finishes and you go to a shootout to decide things, it's like, Oh, this kind of kills the energy a little bit. That's yeah. At and least they got to like, think, yeah. Clean the ice a little bit. And which I get why you want the players to be able to make a move, but it, I don't know. It's anticlimactic, isn't it? I guess. But like, I, I hate the idea of games ending in ties for whatever reason. Like, I think if you're going to go through all that trouble, you might as well get a win and I, or, and there's a loss that will have to happen as a result. And you're right. Like, fine. There are some people who might go into that and they might think, Hey, this kind of feels like a tie, but you know who it doesn't feel like a tie to the teams that win and 50% of the and most of not all, uh, all the time. There's a team that loses. There's a team that wins. So I don't know. I I think that team that that wins feels a little bit differently about those shootouts sometimes. But all well, that okay, to the say, teams might. Yeah. I just don't know what the fans do. And right, we're talking about the entertainment right. value of, of the course. product. Like we're we're really of course, you know. And but it, like, look at the, the the fundamental problem here that has to be solved. And there isn't a perfect solution. You can't play games forever in the regular season, right? Like you can't no. have it just because there's as as fun as it can be in the playoffs every once in a while when there's like a five overtime game or four. Like when it goes ends at two a.m. and you know, the broadcast is telling us about them, like bringing pizzas in and the third overtime intermission, like all that stuff. Like that's novel when it happens once in a while, but you cannot have that as a regular thing, first and foremost. And then secondly, 
you know, I think you're trying to get an end. You're just trying to produce a result. You're right. Like, I think the league, I don't, I don't believe we'll ever go back to ties. I'd be stunned. I mean, it's been a long time since the NHL switched away from ties. Um, so I, I think that they are going to always send it, you know, the, what works about seven minutes, literally it's just, you're extending it by what a little bit more than 25%, um, you know, longer period. They've done this actually in the ECHL and it has done what you would expect. Like the, the numbers, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it bears out that if you go to a seven minute overtime, even more games than in overtime, than then go to a shootout. I think the league since going to three on three, we've seen a decline in the number of shootouts. So really, this would just be another measure to just reduce by some percentage points the the likelihood of a shootout. And I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, the process that this has to go through next is, you know, there's a competition committee made up of, you know, mix of GMs and players, league executives and PA staff uh, that meets in, in the, the spring. And so, you know, it'll have to go there at some point. And maybe if if it survives that, then then maybe we're talking about it becoming a rule before next season I, you know it's a little premature to say what's going to happen in that discussion but you know it does seem like something that enough of the gms were in favor of pushing forward so i don't think the conversation will begin and end in florida i think it's going to continue on into the spring let's move on to uh expansion talk we've uh, heard the city of houston being named as a you know a, de- a potential destination for the nhl one day considering how appealing it is as a u.s market uh, the city of Atlanta has come up a lot in recent days. We know they had the Flames once upon a time. The Atlanta Thrashers were once a thing. But the NHL bothered doing it again for a third time? Uh, what's your take on 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 some of these rumors we've been hearing about expansion coming back? And how is Gary Bettman taking all of this news? And, and what's, his, what's his view on, on, on the expansion or potential of expansion? Or is he even in expansion mode? Well, I'll put it this way. I'm old enough to say I covered this league when it was a 30 team league. So I've actually lived through a couple back in my day. So I've lived through a couple expansion periods. I also covered the league when the Atlanta Thrashers existed and actually was in Winnipeg when the Jets 2.0 were born their first game against the Montreal Canadiens. I think in 2011 or 2012. Anyway, my point is I've seen this manifest itself in a couple ways over those years. And Here's what happens. The league does not even hint at expansion until it is expanding, or it doesn't hint at a team moving until it's happening. Like, like that's how it went. There was actually a board of governors meeting. I mentioned in our last show, like we all just went there like a normal board of governors meeting. And all of a sudden Gary Bettman comes out the way he did, you know, yesterday at the the press avail. And he goes, we're going to Vegas. This is going to be the owner. We have to get this many season tickets. Like he just laid it out. And so here's the point. He's never going to say we're, expanding and then like it's not going to be three years of him opining on the possibility of expansion before they expand right and so we're left to do that for him and i'll say this i found it very interesting that he was asked sort of a general question about expansion and he says we're getting interest from different entities and cities places like atlanta places like houston places like quebec city of course quebec city is not a surprise to any of us we know there have been constant meetings with with government officials there in the nhl and we've discussed those before right my point is that one wasn't secret now i know that there's been more you know houston it's been reported um you know had a meeting with with the league i want to say three or four years ago it was pre-pandemic but not long before so that interest has been public there's been more sort of whispers lately about atlanta but that's the first time to my knowledge gary bettman publicly in you know, in recent days has, or recent months, years, whatever, has talked about Atlanta as a possibility. And he even noted on a question on Atlanta, well, the people interested kind of in building an arena there, and it's, it's in a different part of the city than we've ever been. Like, they kind of, at least to me, laying the groundwork for this, this might be different than the previous two teams that tried and failed in Atlanta uh, with, you know, which ultimately had the wrong set of ownership groups and, and set up there. And so, I would say that while Gary Bettman did say it's not front burner for now, it's not, we're not looking, we're not in expansion mode as you nodded to. He didn't shoot it down, uh, nor really should he, right? It's his job to grow business. Like he doesn't have to say anything really. He, he probably wants those teams to be interested. He wants people to want to invest in his league. You know, he got $500 million as an expansion fee for Vegas, U.S., that gets split among the owners, doesn't get shared with the players, just goes to the existing owners. He got $650 million um, for the team uh, that went to Seattle, 
more money that goes right into owners' pockets. You've got an Ottawa senator sale going on that I believe is going to end up north of 800 million, perhaps north of 900 million for that franchise in one of the league's smaller markets in a Canadian city that needs a new arena as part of it. Um, you know, you can see where this is going. The next expansion fee is going to be much more than the Kraken paid, I think. And so if you're Gary Bettman, it's not to say this is happening next year or the year after. Like, I don't know the timeline. I'll be frank on that. But it, it only stands to reason to me, looking at the way the business works and the way it, what I've existed in the past, that there will be expansion again on the horizon, probably in the not too distant future. And the biggest reason for that is you've got big cities out there that want teams and you have ownership possibilities that want to spend huge, huge money. And that literally just gets spread among the, the existing owners. I mean, that's that's it's probably good business, Julian. Like, I know that someone's going to say, well, it's too many teams. Like, I don't know. Was there that much difference between 30 and 31 and 32 and 33 and 34? Really? Like, really? And if you're the union, I mean, it's more jobs, right? You got more players in the league. Like, there's not too many people this hurts, at least on paper. <laughs> like, like, like in, in from 10,000 feet, I mean, I, I don't know what the too many number is, but I, I just... I found it interesting, put it this way, that he acknowledged cities, that he, you know, kind of gave an explanation for why it might be different if they ever thought to go back to Atlanta, and that he he put in there at the moment or for now, I can't remember the exact phrasing, but he 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 kind of qualified it. He left himself an opening there to say it's it's not a front burner front burner issue right now, but you know, check back in a few weeks and see where we're at. Yeah, I have a hard time thinking that it's that's too many teams for anybody you laid out some really good reasons with uh more jobs uh obviously more revenue hopefully for for the league coming in also like if you're a fan and you're like oh too many teams considering how regional and local hockey fans are with their teams does it really matter to you that there would be 34 teams instead of 32 considering that there's a good chance you focus a lot on your own team anyway like, I, I don't know, unless like the schedule gets to a point where it's like we have to have 90 games to account to to accommodate uh, all these teams. And I don't even know if it necessarily has to go that high in order to do that. They could probably still stick it at 82. You just have to change up whatever mechanism you have that sees the amount of teams play against each other for a certain t- amount of times during a year. But I, I there's nothing wrong with more teams. I guess the biggest thing is just, you know. Houston and Atlanta and then Quebec city is off to the side or some other Canadian market that so many people, especially in this country are clamoring for look, Toronto 2.0 get... Toronto 2.0 Hamilton makes as well. too much sense. Yeah. I mean, it, one or the other, I mean, cause it's kind of one and the yeah. same thing. A lot of people that work in Toronto live in Hamilton. Like it, 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 I'm not saying you bring four teams to the GTA, although you could probably find a way to make it work financially. I mean, look at Seattle and Vegas too. They're two of the top, earning revenue organizations in the entire league, despite being in their infancy, or at least, you know, Kraken are in their infancy. I guess the, the gold Knights are a toddler at this point in time. They've been around for a few years. Um, you know, it was interesting. Exactly. It was interesting. I hadn't really thought about it lately because I haven't been looking at playoff matchups yet. It seems too far out, but you know, Seattle and Vegas might play in the first round, which could be kind of cool. Like the two, two expansion cousins or whatever, you know, going head to head. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I again, I didn't come away thinking this is happening right away, but there was nothing in the comments, in the feel of the conversation that that made me think, oh yeah, like we're we're going to be talking about expansion again at some point soon. You know what I just remembered uh, before we move on to our next topic, uh, the twenty twenty four Winter Classic. Do you know who those two teams are? Vegas and Seattle. Yeah, so if we get a Seattle Vegas playoff series, that's it's just built in tension already. I think the NHL would probably like Seattle versus Vegas in the first round, or at least some kind of playoff series. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, like, I'm not cheering for anyone, but I think it'd be cool to see Seattle get in too. Um, I'm not yeah. cheering for in a fan way, but I just think, you know, to that team, it's such a sort of a miserable first season and it's been a lot different this year, but they're, you know, they're, it, it's, it's getting real now. Like they're down to the last, stretch of the season here and it's not a foregone conclusion they're in but they're they're knocking pretty loudly at the door 
Okay, let's move on to the Ottawa Senators. And uh, we know with uh, their, their impending sale, they're probably still going through all the buyers and bidders. And will everyone get their wish of Ryan Reynolds being a NHL owner? Who knows? We have to wait. What's the latest you can tell us on that? Well, I'll tell you this. All indications are that Ryan Reynolds, he's joined what's known as the Rennington Group, um, which you know is a, a bid led by the, the Brady family. Uh, from north of Toronto, and all indications are he's not jumping to another bid if his bid isn't chosen. And there's at least five bids that I know of, and there may be more because the NHL is being quite tight-lipped and, and understandably so uh, about the exact you know how these look and who's offering what and this and that. And so I don't know if Ryan Reynolds will be part of the NHL because I you know it's too soon to say if his will be the winning bid. And, and if it's true that he doesn't want to say move to another bid at the last moment, if, if it looks like someone else is in pole position in this race, then, you know, maybe we'll, we'll be in a world without him. I still think it makes so much sense. I mean, obviously from a marketing standpoint, you see that he's, you know, his mint mobile down in the U S just sold for 1.35 billion. I think he was about a 20 to 25% owner in that company. Um, you know, we've talked about what he did with, with Wrexham and, and what he continues to do in, in, you know, lower level soccer uh, in Wales and England. Um, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense, but we don't, we don't know yet, but what I think maybe my takeaway from the jams meeting specifically is that, you know, we're probably not too far away, uh, from getting a little more clarity here. You know, Gary Bettman indicated the next stage of the process is winnowing down the number of groups you know, trying to entice those that are in the final two or three to up their offers. And, and then it'll, it's a matter of a couple of weeks from that point until a decision's made. So, you know, I, I would like to think that somewhere by the draft, give or take, we're going to know the, the, the new identity of the, the Senator's ownership group, but certainly the process seems like it's going well. And uh, we'll have to see if Ryan Reynolds ends up, you know, making a, a Senator's Netflix style series or Amazon prime style series or, or not. I want a Deadpool uh, alternate jersey for the Ottawa Senators. Like, instead of, like, the the O, it's just, like, a logo of Deadpool. I guess kind of in the shape of the Ottawa O as a third jersey. If Ryan Reynolds becomes a persp- becomes owner of the Ottawa Senators, of course. It's possible, man. It's possible. Have you even watched Deadpool? Probably not. No. That's you big... might like it. That's you big... might like Deadpool. I, I think you might like it. You might like the humor. Uh, Ryan Reynolds is pretty great in it. Like he's built to play that character. It's a bit crass. Uh, it, you're not going to get too bogged down with like the whole Marvel multiverse stuff. Like I think as a stand, the first one, especially good standalone fun time. I, I'm open to it. I didn't watch a movie on my flights to Florida. I actually had to work on these flights. So, uh... but it's okay. It's okay. There's future flights to come. I'm still trying to watch movies. Go check out the menu good. if you want good. to be thoroughly disturbed. Mm, I might have to consider that. If we uh, if we get to do a live show in Nashville, we might have to definitely bring back the uh, CJ's Film Club or the uh, the movie <laughs> game. We'll see I'm how game. that goes. I'm game. Um, let's get to one other thing uh, before we get to stick taps here. There was a um, a bit of a troubling video that surfaced a couple of days ago involving uh, the son of Philadelphia Flyers GM, uh, Danny Briere, uh, his son Carson, who plays at Mercyhurst University, who uh, was at a bar with friends, and you see him pushing a wheelchair down a flight of stairs. Obviously, the wheelchair gets damaged. Um, a lot of reaction on social media, statements from uh, the, uh, the Briere family. Obviously, the wheelchair belonged uh, to someone. I believe that person has since made themselves known on Twitter. Uh, someone else shared the video as well, and they started a GoFundMe uh, to raise money for that broken wheelchair. Um, uh, Mercyhurst has put uh, Carson and two other players involved uh, on uh, indefinite suspension until uh, the completion of their investigation. Look, we both know this was a very troubling thing to see. Uh, it was just very... It's it's not a good look, obviously. No, it's um, mean. It's yeah. mean. It's it's very mean. Like it's not yeah. for me. There's no gray in this one. Like it's just it's obvious that there's going to have to be a price paid here. I'm sure that's going to happen. I mean, Mercyhurst acted pretty quickly by 
you know, acknowledging the video, then now suspending the players, they're going to do some sort of investigation. I would imagine issued apology statements aren't going to be enough to satisfy things. And I just hope that eventually, first of all, that they're held to account for what's an awful mean thing to do. And secondly, that they learn from it. I mean, that, that that's the only thing I can see that, that needs to come out of this, quite honestly. And it, it's nice that the, the young woman, Sydney's made herself known. She said she doesn't want the GoFundMe money. She wants it to go the, to those that need it. And so hopefully at the end of this, something positive can come of it. But actually, if, if you go from the time the video first landed to action and, and you know, things have moved pretty quickly here and, and it seems like in a logical manner. Yeah. Um, I hope uh, the Briere family pays for that wheelchair. It's a, it's a bit ridiculous to me that it got to a point where a GoFundMe had to be done. But yeah, I too hope something positive comes out of that. Um, we're pretty much at the end of our show today. Um, I'm not sure in terms of a stick tap if you have one, if you have a quick one you want to do before we get out of here. Yeah, producer Nick gets my stick tap because he tried the chicken Big Mac and told me it's a two out of ten. So uh, he saved me from having to do that because I was thinking about trying that thing, but now I, I don't need to waste my time, my money, or my belly on it. So thank you, producer Nick. You get my stick tap this week. I will give my stick tap to uh, ESPN and Disney for their work on uh, the uh, big green. Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it. The uh, big city greens classic uh, that they had uh, in uh, line with the Rangers Capitals game this week. So I'll show some love to those guys for that. All right, uh, we're out of here. We'll be back on Monday with a brand new episode. CJ, Julian, peace. Subscribe to the podcast, however you listen to podcasts, and get your questions in now for Ask CJ. The Chris Johnson Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter, at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie, at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.